former Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall once said, wherever you see wrong, wherever you see injustice or inequality, it's your job to stand up and to speak out. This is your democracy. You make it, you protect it, and you pass it on. The United States today has continued to see attacks on our democracy, whether they be abroad or at home. We have been at war since before I was born, and the United States continues to struggle with threats to democracy. But the greatest threat to our democracy doesn't lie abroad for the United States. It's within our very system, the Electoral College. Senator Daniel Patrick Moulihan in, 2000, in 1995 excuse me, said that eventually we're going to have to address the issues that the Electoral College poses to the United States. But we're also going to have to address issues of apportionment and representation. We have continued to see a Congress that is more representative of the American people. But we've also seen that time after time throughout history, we have had a system that allows certain people to win the presidency while others are left behind, even though they won the popular vote. It's time for us to address the Electoral College today. And it's time for us to ask the question, what should be done with the Electoral College? Today we'll focus on two areas of analysis. First, we'll look at how we have to abolish the Electoral College before finally moving on to discuss how we can reapportion representation in the United States Senate so that we have a more representative Congress. But first, we have to absolutely abolish the Electoral College in order to best help our democracy in the United States. We'll see this through two separate avenues. We can do it through abolishment in, in Congress, or we can see it through abolishment with the National Popular Vote Compact among the states. But first, we can abolish it through the Congress. CNN notes this on January 12th of this year, where they ask, what can we do to help save our democracy today? They answer it by saying that we can pass a, any of the bills that have been proposed by legislators in the House and the Senate to get rid of the Electoral College. That same article goes on to note that it has become one of the greatest threats to American democracy at home. We have to continue to focus on how we can best help our citizens. And that means we have to address the issue of the Electoral College. For too long we've seen the Electoral College be unjust, unequal, and unfair to the American people. We don't have a voice or a vote in the United States as long as the Electoral College continues to stay in place. Because it allows electors to choose the president not the American people. But we also understand that there is hyperpartisanship in the United States Congress. So it's extremely difficult for us to get it abolished through Congress. That's why we can look at the National Popular Vote Compact to do the job for us. The Hill notes on January 15th of this year that the National Popular Vote Compact is a movement where states will pass laws in their General Assembly or their state assemblies that would give the electoral votes of that state to the winner of the popular vote. While CNN again notes on April 29th that we have now seen 189, 189 electoral votes are now part of the National Popular Vote Compact, meaning states have passed those legislation, that legislation to give their, pop, their electoral votes to the popular vote winner. Now that same article tells us that over 20 states have laws like this in the legislature currently which amounts to over 90 electoral votes, which is more than what we need for the National Popular Vote Compact to be initiated. Meaning that we can hit 270 electoral votes easily. And these states that have the legislation currently in their General Assemblies are both Republican-held and Democratic-held states. Bipartisanship is important in the United States, and we've strayed too far away from it. The National, Pop the National Popular Vote Compact is a way to come back to bipartisanship and to get things done for the American people. But we have to understand that once we abolish the Electoral College, we have to address reapportionment in the Senate. Senator Moonahan knew that in 1995, and Dr. Akid Amar tells us this as well on January 12th of 2019. See, Dr. Amar is from Yale Law, and he says that we have to have a referendum on the United States Senate, meaning we have to reapportion representation in the Senate based on population in the United States. Dr. Eric Ortz from Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania goes a step further. When on February 16th of 2019, he proposes that we completely revamp the United States Senate 
First, we would add 10 seats, so we have 110 senators. Then, we divide it up based on population for each state. Each state is guaranteed at least one United States senator. Then, based on population of the United States as a whole and how much they hold, then they will get more or less. This means that California will get 12 senators. New York and Florida will get six. Texas will get nine. This allows us to have better representation in Congress. And as the Atlantic notes on January 12th, this kind of a movement would actually allow us to see a Congress that is fair, something that we haven't seen for a while. Because a senator from the state of Idaho or state of Wyoming has 67 times the voting power as a senator from California. That's not fair in the United States. And the Electoral College is one of the reasons we have this system in the first place. So once we abolish the Electoral College, either, either through Congress or at the state level, we have to address reapportionment in the United States Senate in order to continue to have better representation for the American people. This is something that the Hill knows. Because on March 21st, they tell us that in order for us to get there, we can either propose this plan through Congress or a massive push in state legislatures. We have seen these kind of movements happen before. It's the whole reason we had the Electoral College. Enough people said, hey, we should have something change, and we did over 150, 200 years ago. And now it's time to re come back to that and completely change Congress as we know it today. At the end of the day, we have to look at the question, what can be done to fix the Electoral College? And we look at two main areas. First, we have to abolish it. That's all that's going to happen in order to fix it. And we can do it on a congressional level or through the National Popular Vote Compact. But once we do that, we have to address reapportionment of representation in the United States Senate. Because in, after we abolish the Electoral College, we have to fix the system that caused the problem in the first place. At the end of the day, Thurgood Marshall was absolutely correct when he said that this is our democracy. We make it. We protect it. And we pass it on. If we want a democracy that is strong for the future of America, if we want to ensure that future generations have accurate representation in the United States Congress, we will make these changes. It's time for us to protect our democracy. It's time for us to abolish the Electoral College.